Hey guys, Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to another virtual lecture. In today's video, we're going to learn about hypothesis testing for dependent samples. Now before this, you've been introduced to samples that are independent of each other. In other words, they come from populations that have nothing to do with each other. However, sometimes there are situations where observations drawn in one sample may have something in common or something to do with observations drawn in the second sample. Okay, so this is known as a dependent sample. In other words, the samples are paired or related in some manner. So how can we differentiate between dependent and independent samples? There are several ways, but these are the most popular ways to find out. First of all, samples are dependent if they involve a before and after situation. For instance, if you wanted to measure the effectiveness of a new program or a new diet, we may want to measure the weights of the participants at the start of the program and later at the end of the program. So as you can see, the participants are still the same people, only their weights are shown in two different observations. Secondly, samples are also dependent if they involve matching or pairing observations. For instance, if we wanted to buy a car, we may want to look at the same car model at two or more different dealerships and compare the prices. As always, our hypothesis tests follow the same six steps. To recall, the first step is to write the hypothesis. The second step is to determine the level of significance, or alpha. The third step is to calculate the test statistic. The fourth step is to write down the decision rule and step five is to make a decision, either to reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. And finally, step six is to come up with a conclusion. However, there are two main differences in the steps where we want to do a dependent samples test. One is in writing the hypothesis, and secondly, in calculating the test statistic. Let's look at both of this in turn. First of all, when we want to write the hypothesis, we need to create a new variable, d. This is because for a dependent samples test, we are more concerned with the distribution of the differences between the two observations. Let me give you an example. Say we want to measure the effectiveness of a particular diet program. Say we have six participants, participant A, B, C, D, E, and F. Now, before they all undergo this diet program, we will need to measure their weights, right? So these are a distribution or a list of their weights before the program. XA, XB, XC, XD, XE, and XF. So again, these are all random variables, okay? The weights before the diet program. And then, all of these participants will go through the program for a few months. Later, at the end of the program, their weights will be measured again. After. So this is X A hat, let's say. X B hat, X C hat, X D hat, X E hat, and X F hat. Okay. So as you can see, guys, these participants are the same people. However, we've got two separate observations for each of them. Okay, so this is how you visualize a dependent sample. Okay, I repeat, they're from the same or they originate from the same people or same objects. However, you can see here we've got two separate observations. Okay, so this is what it means by dependent samples. You can see we've got two samples here, sample one and sample two, but they are related in some manner in that they both belong to the same people. So how can we conduct a test for dependent samples? Now you need to understand our main concern are not the before and after observations. Our main concern is the difference between these two observations. Okay, so maybe it's XA minus XA hat, XB minus XB hat, XC minus XC hat, XD minus XD hat, XE minus XE hat, and XF minus XF hat. Okay, so basically we're going to find the difference. This is the difference for the person A. 
the difference for the person B, the difference for person C, the difference for the person uh, D, the difference for person E, and the difference for person F. As you can see here, we have a distribution of the sample difference. Okay? So this is basically what we're going to look at. Now, since this is our new random variable, as always, from a random variable, we'll be able to find the average and dispersion, right? So imagine, if we add all of these differences together, what we can we have? We can have the average difference, right? Let's say we add all of these differences, divide it with the number of participants, we'll be able to get something called the D bar, okay? So this is basically the sample difference. We can also find the dispersion or standard deviation. Okay, how can we find the difference? Each and every one of these differences for the individual person, D minus the mean difference, square them and add all of their squared difference and divide by the degrees of freedom, N minus 1. In this case, it's 1 because technically, although we've got two observations here, but because we're only focusing on the difference, so technically it's as if we only have one sample. Okay, and we square root all of it. Now let's take a look at this example and try to write our hypothesis as well as calculate the test statistic. Step 1. How can we write the hypothesis? Since our main focus is not these two, observation separately but rather the difference okay so for our hypothesis we are focusing on the average of the differences okay so this is the now and this is the alternate remember the hypothesis is always for the population so we're focused on the mean or population mean of the difference okay right so now as always we always assume for the null hypothesis there is no difference Okay, so when there's no difference, it means it is equals to zero. No difference. It's as if, if we were to minus these for each of the participants, there is no difference. That means, in other words, we're saying that the diet program isn't that effective. Okay, zero. Alternatively, we can say that there is a difference. Okay. Why do we put not equals to? Because if it's not equals to zero, there's a figure. Any figure means there is a difference. Okay, it might indicate effectiveness of the program. So this is how we write the hypothesis for a dependent sample test. Now step two is to calculate the test statistic. So the first thing we need to do to calculate the test statistic is to find these two fellas. So number one, you need to calculate the sample difference okay secondly you need to calculate the sample standard deviation of the difference now once we have these two in place we can calculate the test statistic by using the t distribution okay so how is it d bar which is this one over the standard deviation of the difference over the square root of the sample size now let's try to do this example to understand the concept of a dependent sample test better. The federal government recently granted funds for a special program designed to reduce crime in high crime areas. A study of the results of the program in eight high crime areas yielded the following results. So as you can see here, these are the different areas which have crimes. And here's a list of the crimes before the program and here are the list of crimes after the program. The question is, has there been a decrease in the number of crimes since the launch of the program? Use the 1% significance level. Okay, we need to understand something here. When we say there's a decrease or a fall in the number of crimes, isn't it logical for the numbers in the after to be smaller than the numbers at the before? 
Now, since we want to say that there's a decrease or a fall in the number of crimes, we can say that after, the numbers after is less than before, right? So just the purpose of um, illustration, let's just pick a number. Let's say before there are six crimes. So if the program is effective, therefore after would be lesser than six. Let's just choose a number, five, okay? So six is greater than five. Now, if we were to find the difference between these two figures, so let's take five and put it to the left-hand side, six minus five, which is one, would definitely be more than zero, right? So in other words, the difference here, the difference is more than zero. But this difference is only for one particular case. If we're talking about the population in general, we're going to say that the average difference is more than zero, or a positive difference, which makes sense because if there's a decrease or if there's a fall in the number of crimes, the program is effective, meaning that the average or the difference is positive. Your understanding is important when we want to write down the hypothesis, right? So as I mentioned to before, for a dependent sample test, we're focusing on the average of the difference, okay? The difference or the average, the mean difference for the population is assumed to be zero, okay? We always assume that there's no difference for the null hypothesis. But for the alternate, because we're talking about a decrease in the number of crimes, meaning that the average difference is positive, okay? So again, if you're wondering how we get this, it's from this understanding, okay? Step two. As usual, we're going to write our alpha, which is 1% at this point, okay? And is this a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? Yes, it's a one-tailed test because the sign for the alternate hypothesis points to a particular direction. Now let's find out or let's calculate our test statistic. Calculating the test statistic. It is, and as I mentioned to you before, we need to do uh, two things first. We need to, first of all, calculate the mean difference. Okay, so how can we find the mean difference? It's basically the sum of all of the difference for each uh, case divided by the total number of cases. In our case here, the cases are the crimes, yeah? Right. So you don't really need to come up with a new table. You can just use the existing table. So here's the D or the difference. So you just find the difference. 14 minus 2, so you can get 12. 7 minus 7, 0, 4 minus 3, 1, minus 3 is 4. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to add up all of these values and divide it with the number of crime areas, which are 8. So we're going to get 29. And we divide by 8 because there are 8 crime areas. So the average is 3.625. Okay, once we have the mean difference, we want to find the standard deviation of the difference. Okay, standard deviation of the distribution of differences, right? So each and every one of the difference minus the mean difference, okay? Square it and sum it together and divide by n minus 1. And square root it all because we want to find the standard deviation. So I let you work on that. Okay, here's the number. Okay, you can maybe freeze this frame and work on it. Each and every one of these differences, for instance, 12 minus... 3.625 square, okay, plus, and plus, and go on and so forth, and try to work on that. So basically here, what you'll get is up here. So the total um, standard deviation of the difference is 4.8385. Okay, and now, finally, you want to calculate the test statistic, which is T, which is to find the difference, D bar over standard deviation of the difference over the square root of the sample size. So here, we're basically just going to plug in all these figures. 3.625 over 4.8385 over square root of 8. So you will get 2.12. Is step number 4, which is to establish or write down our rejection rule. What that means is it involves us to sketch the rejection area, right? Okay, so here, since we use T for the test statistic, our distribution is T. Okay, the center here is always zero. 
Okay, so we know it's a one-tailed test, okay, from the sign of the alternate, and since it's pointing to a positive direction, so we know that the rejection area is a positive here. So this is where we reject the null, and here is our alpha, which is 1%. Remember, the entire alpha is here because it's a one-tailed test. And here is where we do not reject the null because these are all of the acceptance area. Okay, so now the value here, the critical value, is the value that separates the acceptance area from the rejection area. So now you go and look at your t-table. Okay, first of all, we need to calculate what our degrees of freedom is. Degrees of freedom is the sample size minus 1. Our sample size in this question is 8 minus 1 with 7, yeah? Okay, so you look at your t-table, look at degrees of freedom 7, and look at one tilt test 1%. Okay, so you will find that the critical value is 2.998. Okay, so now let's write down our rejection rule. Our rejection rule is reject the null hypothesis if our test statistic, or t, is greater than 2.998. Right. Finally, step 5 and 6. Okay, we want to make a decision and a conclusion. So we just compare our test statistic, which is 2.12. Where is it? Okay, here. We compare our 2.12 and see whether it falls in the acceptance or rejection area. 2.12 somewhere here, guys. Okay, you can, you know, just label anywhere as long as it kind of makes sense. Okay, so you can see that since the test statistic lies where? In the acceptance area. What do we do? We do not reject the null. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. So what's our conclusion? And we can conclude that, okay, let's go back here. Okay, to conclude, we always go back to step one. So we need to understand the problem. So we say we do not reject, right? Do not reject. What does it mean here? There is no difference. So in a way, we do not agree lah, with the question. Because the question is asking us, has there been a decrease? So the answer is no. There has not been a decrease in the number of crimes. So that's what we're going to write here. So we can conclude that the number of crimes, number of crimes have not have not decreased, okay, since the launch of the program. You may want to underline that, have not decreased, okay?